Humanity. Anyway, so so good morning. Um, sorry about that, but uh, here we are. Um, yesterday was an amazing day, right? I'm always glad to be back to this conference and see all of you, right? Um, representing this diverse range of animal lovers who are all committed and uh, dedicated to uh, preserving the human animal bond. And we get to get together every year in this uh, fantastic umbrella organization, National Animal Interest Alliance, the only group of its kind that brings us all together for a common purpose, right? So I'm super excited to be here. Now, yesterday was a really sweet day. We talked about puppies all day and it was lovely and it was uh, informative and we had a great time. And today is all about controversy. So my favorite part of the conference. <laughs> so, so um, and it's actually, there's some quite serious stuff going on that even you folks who stay in the know are not aware of, right? Um, so uh, I came back to, let's see, I came to this organization in 2015, Patty called me and asked me to give a talk back in 2015. And um, at the end of this talk, and I gave this talk, it was called, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. It's part of the talk, so I don't wanna tell you now, but um, I gave this talk and it was very intense. And it ended with this video that sort of represented our issues at the time. And this was in 2015. And every year I come here, she begs me to play it again. <laughs> so I'm going to play it right now for you. Some of you may remember it, but I want you to pay very careful attention to what you see in this video and what you know now to be true. We are going to quickly and aggressively move to make horse carriages no longer a part of the landscape in New York City. We are going to get rid of the horse carriages, period. They're not humane. It's over. When man filmed the first moving images, he turned the camera on something deeply familiar, a companion that had been by his side for thousands of years. And when he built ships and roads and cities, they did the work side by side. Now their work together is mostly forgotten, and only a rare few of us still carry forward that ancient bond. Our society, we have forgotten so much about horses. We used to all know about horses. And the animal rights people have been able to exploit that. There are no horse torturing monsters in this business. And I'm here and always have been here because of my love for horses. My horse name is Rebecca. I fall in love with her in day one. The first day that I drove her in Pennsylvania, I knew that this is my baby. Why should I? mistreat my horse what would be the reason to do that you know it gives me so much back in terms of uh, happiness all the cookies most people have heard that the new york city carriage horses are overseen by five agencies that they can't work if it's too hot or too cold that they get a five-week vacation and mandatory health care the new york carriage horses have a guaranteed retirement in green pastures but many horses are not so lucky. When we stopped working with horses on a daily basis, horses became luxury items. And when they're luxury items, when bad things happen to you in your life, that means they're disposable. The animal, the horse or, or the donkey or whatever that does not have a job is the one that's in, in jeopardy. <laughs> She wants the words fall out on a
everyone's out here to protest SeaWorld because too many dolphins die senselessly, also SeaWorld can make a profit. Go out of business. <laughs> Bob Barker here on behalf of PETA. If you're thinking about a trip to SeaWorld, please reconsider. Life in cramped tanks is no prize for orcas and dolphins. They want to be free with their families in the ocean. Many have died prematurely at SeaWorld. SeaWorld's been rescuing marine mammals since before there was even a Marine Mammal Protection Act. So that commitment has been there for years. We've done 22,000 rescues to date, four decades of doing this. Any call we get for any animal, we will go rescue it, bring it back, rehabilitate it, release it, return it. The goal of our stranded rescue program is to make sure that we get these animals, we nourish them back to health, and we get them back out to the wild as quickly as possible. And the 100% goal is to return them back to the wild. Our animals are better cared for than many people. Anything that we need or that, that we think that the animals need, the veterinarians are there. What we can learn from our animals in a park applies to the animals out in the natural environment. We have a lot of people from our professional community who approach us with questions. Hey, I've never seen this before because chances are we have simply because we have so many animals that we take care of. Husbandry behaviors with animals are crucial. They're some of the most important behaviors we train. It's the science of training animals to cooperate with us so that we can give them great care. We do this through the application of positive reinforcement. So the animals are making a conscious decision to perform a behavior that allows us to take better care of them. Anytime our guest walks into the park and pays for their ticket, they are actually helping us rehabilitate all the animals that come through SeaWorld. She walks the words fall out. The ELF is a spinoff of another group called the ALF, or Animal Liberation Front, whose masked members have been known to videotape themselves breaking into research labs where they destroy years of painstaking work and free captive animals. In recent years, they've capped off their visits by burning down the buildings. Still, they insist they are nonviolent. The criminals are in there. The only federal law that exists today to cover animals used in experiments is the Animal Welfare Act. It doesn't cover 95% of the animals used in experiments. It doesn't cover mice, rats, birds, so most animals are not protected by the Animal Welfare Act. Well, on the face of it, it seems or it appears that those animals aren't protected by any regulation, but that's in fact not true. There are other organizations who provide oversight over what happens in biomedical research. Think of all the medicines we have, and if we didn't do animal research, all of that just goes away. Without treatment, I would probably have passed away. My name is Livia. I am nine years old. I was diagnosed with apathic anemia. I found out that my treatment had been tested on animals. I feel very thankful for the animals that are going through animal testing. Without animal testing, they wouldn't know if the treatment would work.
Every single medical advance has become a part of our lives that wasn't a part of the lives of our ancestors, it was directly related to, in almost every single case, animal-based research. There's an entire dedicated, specially trained workforce of compassionate, loving people um, who care for these animals. These are the people who are with the animals every single day, who are making sure that they have food and water, who are making sure that they have all of the appropriate toys. Some animals need to dig, some animals need to climb, some animals need to root. If they can't do that, they'll get stressed out. And we don't want that for them. We don't want that for them because we love them and it's the right thing to do. And we don't want that for them because if they're stressed, then the information that comes from them will be skewed. Everywhere you turn, you see somebody who's benefited from necessary animal research. We all love these animals. And I think it's true that we all wish that they weren't still necessary for biomedical progress. Um, but for now, they are. She wants to let the words fall out. Intense, right? So I remember when Patty called me, you know, like we had just met and uh, she asked me to give a talk. And so I put something together and then she called me and said, well, what's the name of it going to be? And I said, oh, uh, speak now or forever rest in peace. <clears throat> and she said, don't you mean or forever hold your peace? And I said, oh, no, no, I mean, speak now or forever rest in peace. And I think <clears throat> it's been eight years. And now that you've seen that, um, Things have changed. We've seen these things sort of unfold before our eyes, right? And it's all a matter of uh, us just not speaking up when we should have, right? Ignoring things. You know, we, we created this informational void when it came to our work with animals and then stepped aside and let fanatics with their own agenda fill it with fiction. And now this false narrative is what rules the world. And the legislators are listening and the voters are listening and the public is listening. And the same public that's listening and voting based on inaccurate information is harmed because of it. Um, just a couple of things since uh, 2015, when all of those things were still active and, and going on that have happened. Um, the uh, carriage horses were under huge attack, they won, but now this is a, a new attack. So they're back again. And that fight hasn't really stopped. Um, there have been carriage horses in other cities who have been asked to stop. Of course, I don't know anything about those people, and maybe some of them should stop, right? Because we, as an organization, never support anyone who isn't actually being a good steward of their animals and, and doing well by them and providing appropriate welfare. But I know this group is doing an amazing job, and they shouldn't be harassed. Um, and I don't know how many of you have ever been to Manhattan and seen these beautiful animals. Raise your hand. Yeah, well, I have. I mean, I grew up in New York, and, uh, and it's really, they're beautiful. These folks love them, and they have the pleasure of getting to work with them every single day, and they're incredibly dedicated <clears throat> to these animals, um, and the children love them, uh, and, and the people of the city love them, too, and so that's going on. Um, SeaWorld went through it, right? Blackfish came out, and it was filled with propaganda and misinformation. Um, the orcas were on hold for a while, then they sort of changed the, the nature of the show to be sort of more educational, which is fine. Um, and I think what you got from that video is that one of the things they do, one of the major things they do with the revenue that they get is rehab. Right? So they're out there um, rehabbing animals and uh, putting money toward the conservation of these beautiful aquatic species that people don't know about and won't know about if they don't get to see them and interact with them, right? And so that was the whole deal there. And speaking of which, the elephants in Ringley Brothers did have to go. So they lost that battle. 
Um, raise your hand if you've ever gone to that circus. Uh, you know, my grandmother used to take me there like every year. Uh, <clears throat> and it was amazing. Um, and we learned about all of these interesting animals. And of course it was entertaining and all of that. But um, the animal, the elephants are gone now from the circus. Um, I saw something the other day where they're trying to come back as a circus, but without any kind of animal. Um, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, but I will tell you something, again, about the truth with respect to how these folks really feel about these animals, right? So this is my sore. And uh, this is a headline about her going to um, her new retirement home. And we were very fortunate uh, as a board uh, during one of the NAIA conferences in Florida to go to the sanctuary where these Ringling Brothers, uh, the, the felled animals live, right? So it's a sanctuary and it's a conservation center because they're still doing everything they can to help conserve these animals and preserve their ability to live. This is the, you know, the human animal uh, habitat stuff is going on, the human animal conflict out in, in Asia is a real problem. And so the elephants struggle with that. And so a lot of their revenue is going toward that because they absolutely adore elephants. Everybody there loves them. In fact, I got to give my sore a big kiss myself. They um, are incredibly friendly and they love people. And that was, it was kind of a nice day, but also a really sad day. But the elephants um, are in good hands because they're with people who love them. What's changed is they don't have the same ability now to help animals in the wild. And this is the kind of stuff that people aren't realizing when they make these decisions, right? Now, the last thing we saw on the video was related to biomedical research. And I'm sure everybody here is like, well, surely <laughs> nobody's going to be able to move the needle on that in a real way. And they're just going to aggravate you and harass you and scare you and all this. But there won't be any legislators who step up you know, to end biomedical progress right, and, and impact our ability to get medical advances. Surely that won't happen. Well, we're going to talk about that. But before we do, let me just give you a quick refresher <laughs> on what research actually is, because when you say research or you think the word research in your mind, you don't really even know what you're talking about because most people know very little about it, right? They confuse basic research with testing for drugs. And so we just uh, very quickly, real heads up on this, right? So because if we're going to talk about something, we should all be talking about the same thing, right? So research, biomedical research, the study of living systems is a continuum. And most of it is in this basic area here. See this? Most of it, the bulk of research that we do is in trying to understand how living systems work, because we really only have a few clues, right? And Peter will tell you, you know, we send rockets to the moon. Um, you know, we, we have uh, cell phones, you know, these huge computers that used to take up a room, put them in our pocket now, right? All of these technological advances. Why on earth are we still doing research with animals? And the answer is that we designed and created rocket ships. We designed and created computers. We designed and created cell phones, but we did not design and create biological systems. We are biological systems. And we're still trying to figure out how we work. And the fact of the matter is, and there's no question about it, and we got to hear about Darwin yesterday, right? But there's a huge amount of biological conservation across species because nature's lazy that way. <laughs> so we can learn a lot about each other because there's an astounding amount of uh, similarity and it always depends specifically on the question you're asking, which animal best resembles the system you're trying to um, simulate or understand in a human being, right? And so all of that gets done. But the first thing you have to do is understand how it works when it's working properly. And I'll give you one analogy that tends to work very well. Um, I think most of the people in this audience remember uh, car mechanics, right? <laughs> Not now where you go and they plug everything into a computer, right? But that we designed by the way. <laughs> so, but um, back in the day when I was a kid, if something was wrong with your car, right? It was, I don't know, shaking or making funny sounds or smoke was coming out of it or whatever. You go to the mechanic and they open the hood, right? And they tap it and they ask you to step on the gas and they sniff it and they listen to it. And eventually the mechanic would say, oh, I know what's wrong. Now I have a question for you and it's not rhetorical. And I was a teacher. So I will definitely pick on the person who tries to avoid eye contact. Right. The question is, how could this person, after tapping this thing and you know, just kind of looking at it a little for a little bit, how could this person in their mind decide what was wrong with it? What did that person have to know in order to make that decision? They had to know how this thing works when it's working properly, right? How it's put together, every detail of it, right? How it functions when it's working properly. That's the only way you can recognize something that's wrong. And once you recognize something that's wrong, then you have an opportunity to fix it. 
And that is what we're doing in biomedical progress. But it starts with first understanding how these system, uh, systems are put together. And they're so complex. There's, there's the organism, the organ systems, the organs, the tissues, the cells, the, you know, the genes, the molecular pathways. And then all of these levels of complexity are interacting with the environment, making everything even more complicated. So it's huge. And the truth of the matter is, believe it or not, we don't know a whole lot. We have clues about all of these various things. And then millions of people, maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands of researchers over the decades will publish all of these little clues that they get, right? And, and most of that is happening in academic institutions, right? So this is where all the government funding is because this costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of animals. It takes a lot of people from all over the world to sit down and study these various aspects of various things and then publish them, right? Billions of dollars a year in this country alone go toward basic science, just trying to understand biology so we can recognize disease and then eventually develop some sort of therapeutic intervention to help you know, all the people who are struggling with, with all of the various diseases they struggle with, the people we love, including our pets, right? So that's where, that's where most of the, uh, the work is happening and that's where most of the animals are, right? Now, at some point, there are enough clues out there in cyberspace, right? That the pharma groups, um, they can pull some of this information out and say, okay, I'm gonna simplify this, right? It looks like we have enough information to determine that somebody who has disease X has disease X because it looks like their body isn't making protein X. So if we design a drug that acts like protein X, we have a shot at maybe treating this disease so this person doesn't suffer from disease X. And that's the applied part of things. And it's the smallest part of the picture. It's the icing on the cake, I like to call it. But that's the point of it all, right, is to get to that, right? Now, all of that is happening at the pharmaceutical companies, right? So the pharmaceutical companies aren't doing basic research. They're gathering up information that is based on this foundational research. And I'm not talking about a week. I'm talking about decades and decades and decades of basic research. And it's been going on forever, and it will probably continue to go on until we really, really understand everything there is to know about living systems. And that's not going to happen in our lifetime for sure, right? So they take these clues, and now they have a very direct admission. They're going to make some sort of therapeutic intervention to try and address this thing, treat this thing, whatever it is, so that people or animals or both are not suffering from it anymore. So that's happening at pharmaceutical companies, these corporations, right? Hospitals, CROs. And before one of these, so let's say they develop the drug, right? So they develop compound X, <laughs> which is going to be the new miracle drug for people who suffer with disease X, right? And they, so they, de they develop compound X. And before they can release it to the public, they have to put it in thousands of human volunteers, right? In clinical trials. And we're all familiar with clinical trials now because we heard a lot about them during the COVID crisis, right? So all of these people, these, these volunteers, um, some healthy and then later on some sick, will volunteer to see whether or not this compound X is going to work. And so that's where the bulk of testing happens in humans before this drug is released to the public, to other humans, right? Before they can put this compound that they just made, <laughs> right? Completely experimental into a bunch of clinical trial volunteers, humans, they have to make sure it's not gonna kill them or make them really, you know, really, really damage them. It has to be screened for safety, right? Now raise your hand. If I say, hey, I just, I created in this class <laughs> is a new compound. I made it from a bunch of chemicals and, um, and I think it's going to uh, treat a disease. And I know you're a healthy person and you don't have this disease, but uh, you know, Dallas, I want you to just kind of drink this for me and see like if your liver falls out. Yeah, so would you do it? No, if I tell you it's already been tested and, and screened for safety um, and we don't expect any major concerns related to toxicity, would you drink it then in order to help other people? No, it's good. Actually, it's made me very thirsty, so I'm going to drink some of these. Exactly. And so this is where the animals come in. Now, this is testing. What we just talked about in the basic end of the world, I guess it's on this side, is research, basic research. Now we're talking about testing. It's really just testing, screening for safety. Is this drug going to hurt our human volunteers? That's it. That's the pre the preclinical testing that involves animals. Um, and then that's their role and it's over and it's very small. And most of the rest of it is coming from human beings. Any questions about that? Okay, so now the question is, that's quite a system and we've been using it for a long, long time since the thirties, right? The question is, does it work? So I have a couple of stats up here just because I felt the need to put stats up here, <laughs> right? So US cancer death rates, 
fall, have fallen 33%, uh, you know, since 1991. Um, the age-adjusted rates of death attributed to acute heart failure fell over 4% per year across all racial groups uh, from 1999 to 2020. AIDS-related mortality has declined by 57% among women and girls and by 47% among men and boys uh, from 2010 to 2023. Um, I could just ask you, you know, it's obvious questions, right? Raise your hand if you know anybody who had cancer and survived it. That is almost everybody in this room. That's because it works. Raise your hand if you know anybody who struggles with diabetes and is living a normal, healthy life because of the treatments they receive. That's almost, again, almost everybody in this room. That's because this works, right? And people who used to die from HIV <clears throat> can now take a single cocktail and live normal, healthy lives. All of that is because it works. We just don't think about it. We just walk around being healthy and then continue to ask for more and more treatments so we can keep being healthy and living longer, right? So I don't have to give you stats. It's very clear. Just look around you. It works. And every single drug you can think of, every vaccine, every antibiotic, every diagnostic, you know, all the scans, the PET scans, the MRIs, all of that was developed. All the preventives, vaccines, et cetera, all of that was developed uh, with animals through this process that I just mentioned to you. So does it work? Yeah, absolutely it works. Now I'm going to share with you uh, some personal stories about um, my own struggles uh, with uh, members of my family and some health issues. This is Maggie and where's Judy Seltrek? Judy Seltrek was her foster. Maggie is from the Homeless Family Heroes Program um, and she now lives with me. Uh, she was a research dog. By the way, she's not the monkey. She's the actual adorable beagle right there. Um, she sat there by herself, which is why I had to take this picture. She went and sat on the monkey, like she was hanging out with him. She's just so cute. But anyway, uh, Maggie was in research and uh, she was actually involved in a study that was for dogs. So she was involved in a study where they were evaluating, um, uh, what is the... Uh, CBC, is that what it's called? CBD, yeah, I'm thinking of CDC, right? So uh, it, was a CD, it was a CDB ointment and they were trying to determine whether or not it would absorb into the skin and be effective um, as a salve, right? So that was her study. So she had a little port and they rubbed this on her and they would uh, measure the blood uh, levels of the stuff in, inside of her after whatever applications. And then, um, then they removed the port and they probably did a little biopsy of the skin to make sure it didn't create any localized issues. And, and that was it, that was her job. She's very hungry, by the way. And I don't know if it's because she's a beagle or because of all that CBD stuff, but <laughs> I can't tell, but I don't buy Doritos ever because no, I'm just kidding. All right. Yeah, see, all of you people are getting that. You have some explaining to do, Lucy. All right. Anyway, um, yeah, that was a study. Now, way back in the day, she might have been euthanized after that because when the study ends, the money ends. Um, probably not. I mean, for 40 years prior to any of these formal uh, regulations or policies about adopting animals out. Research institutions have been adopting animals out, you know, for quite some time and every kind of animal, even tarantulas, which by the way, I will never adopt a tarantula. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> Not ever. Um, anyway, so this is my Maggie and, and she is a specimen. I mean, I love her. She is so gorgeous. And so like if, she, if there was a Beagle Boy magazine, she would be in the centerfold. She is a gorgeous animal and I just love her to pieces. And thank you, Judy, for doing such a great job with her because she is, she is my heart. Well, <clears throat> Maggie does have horrible teeth and I don't know if that's just a beagle thing or just a research beagle thing. So it was February, just a couple months ago and she had to go in for her routine dental. And while she was in there, the vet found two masses and she came back to me like this. They removed the masses along with, I don't know, five more of her teeth. <laughs> They removed the masses and they went off to pass and the report came back saying that it was subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma. And it said that she had two to three months to live. <clears throat> so that was devastating, obviously. Um, so I did go see an oncologist and um, it looked like the masses, the removals were done very well. So kudos to my vet who is, who is not you know, a surgeon who does this for a living. She did a great job at removing margins and so on and so forth. But we started Maggie on chemo. Um, so she has five rounds of that and they're separated by three weeks. And it's a really nasty chemical, doxorubicin, something we used to work with uh, in cancer studies in research at the time with rodents that I remember quite well. 
Um, anyway, she's uh, had her third course and she just had a scan to see about restaging and how she's doing. And I don't know if you can read this. Actually, I can't read it either on this little screen, but I will I'll read it for you. They did a three view th thoracic radiographs. Um, cardiac silhouette, pulmonary vessels and lungs are normal. No evidence of mediastinal nor pleural space pathology, meaning her lungs and everything in there looks good. There are no abnormalities visible within the portion of the abdomen included. There are no orthopedic abnormalities, unremarkable thorax, no evidence of pulmonary metastatic disease. Right. That's my little love. She's got two more rounds and she has no side effects from it either. It's astounding. She just runs around like nothing happened. Okay. This is Reba, another home family hero dog. And Reba's job was, and some, I don't think people think about this, right? You take your, your, your animals, and we talked a lot about this, and there are veterinarians in the room. You take them to the vet for whatever you take them for. And there are vet techs there who are specially trained to work with these animals. And those folks have to get an education in how to handle those animals. And that was Reba's job. So Reba actually was a dog that went to be, um, to, to go help vet techs train to be vet techs, the vet techs that we, uh, we work with in our, in our clinics, right? So that was Reba's job. Reba likes to eat everything under the sun, including ant bait. This was right around the time that Maggie's diagnosis happened, by the way. I was like, you're kidding me. So Reba comes in out from outside and we had just put some stuff down on the mulch and we've done it for 16 years. We've always had dogs, but I don't know what she, and you know, she got it. So she comes in and she's ataxic. She's wobbling all over the place. It's weird. She starts doing this trembling, like her muscles are just kind of convulsing, not like a seizure. And I freak out, right? And we put two and two together and we realize, oh my God, maybe it's that stuff we put down and we throw her in the, in the slop sink to wash her. We call poison control. Bottom line is she ends up in this special facility. Um, the chemical that was in it was called bifethrin. And so some of you vets will know that, but um, when we talked to the people at the critical care facility, because she couldn't just go to a regular vet, like they, they sent us off to another place. The vet on the other end of the phone, when she heard it was by Fethrin, just said, oh, a really sad sound. And I thought for sure we'd lose her. Um, it was very touch and go. Here she is there trying, because she kept trying to pull out all the catheters and everything else. Um, she was there for two and a half days. And uh, they did her blood work and there were no issues with anything. No, no issues with her kidneys. All of her values were normal. And so Reba came home to us. <laughs> so does it work? Yes, all of that intervention that my animals had came from the same place your treatments come from. This is not just about us. Your animal lovers, your vets get their information from all of the same basic research that we use um, and applied research that we use when we do this work for people. Okay, one last personal story for me. Oh, there's my ears. Just... Can you stand it? I mean, come on, so cute. This is poor Bill. <laughs> so about a month ago, almost exactly a month ago, my friend's son saw this creature on the road, dragging a wet newspaper into the street to eat. And he couldn't really tell when he was still his head from his butt because his eyes had been fully matted over. Um, but he was finally able to catch this animal um, we, uh, we got a hold of him, we took him to the vet and he had every single thing you can think of, every parasite, um, he's got heartworm, his blood work just showed, I mean, it was the starvation profile, he was anemic, um, just really, really, but completely, completely emaciated. And on the form, the vet wrote, and I said, you know, I was gonna try to give him a home, right? I'm gonna help him give him a home. And then the vet wrote on it, you know, very, very poor prognosis, poor Bill, right? So we gave him a chance though, um, took about 10 hours to get these masks. Boy, Patty Cleek and I thought about you every minute of the day. I thought, man, if this one was here with this, it took me 10 hours with a friend to get these mats off of him um, to give you a better idea of how bad they were. They were so thick, you couldn't cut them with scissors. And if you squeezed them, just stinky liquid came out. Um, it, we, we didn't know if he was gonna have eyes because he smelled so bad. We thought, well, maybe that's why the hair, but no, he does have eyes, they were infected. Anyway, this is him. And it was 10 hours to get all that off of him without hurting him. Um, I uh, remember when I took the, the fur off the top of him and you could see his back and his shoulders, I just started crying because he was so skinny. I'd never seen anything like it. <clears throat> so that was a month ago. And so we've been giving him supplements and preventives and, and all the antibiotics and things like that. And, um, and this is all three of them <laughs> about two weeks, two weeks ago.
Watch. 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 Did she, whoops. <laughs> He's filled out a little and he's playing and there's Maggie with her big waggy tail getting ready for her next round of chemo. And there's Reba who eats everything and poisons her so. So, so that's an amazing story. We don't always think about our animals in this story, right? So the question is, does it work? Yes, it works. It works for us and everyone we love, including our pets. Yes, it works. But that's not what we're hearing from, for example, PETA. Right, so Peter's very busy. They're on a crusade right now, trying to convince everyone who will listen, especially legislators, that none of this work with animals has to happen anymore. It's not necessary because there are non-animal alternatives right now that, com that can completely replace animals. We're, we're doing this, it's archaic, and there's no reason for it because these new technologies are even more predictive and better and more sophisticated, and none of this animal work has to happen, and that is their position. And they made a very, very fancy report called the Research Modernization Deal that they're handing out to everybody and their uncle, especially all the legislators, that is uh, filled at the end with data and references that they sort of cherry pick comments from and then build their own context around to create this story, this narrative, right? And I'm, and I'm going to read for you the language, and, I, and there's an important reason for this. So pay attention to the language in blue, because you're going to see it coming up again, right? So this is their plan. They should immediately eliminate animal use. Eliminate it immediately. Not when possible, now. Eliminate it in research areas in which animals have been demonstrated to be poor models. Have you seen any of that? What we see is progress. If animals are poor models for basic or applied research, we don't use them. We are supposed to, we are obligated to choose animals based on the specific question we're asking and how that particular system that's involved in answering that specific question is uh, uh, similar to human to the human condition, right? So that's that's the, the starting point, okay? But they're trying to tell everybody the animals are poor models, um, and because of that, that has impeded scientific progress. So eliminate the use of animals. They're impeding scientific progress because they're poor models for research, right? Then they say increase funds for non-animal studies. I'm all about that. These technologies are powerful and then they can teach us a lot and, and provide a lot of information for us. But they also want you to decrease the funds for animal studies. Now I have news for you. <laughs> the development of these non-animal alternatives, the information for that development also came from what we've learned from animal studies, right? And the more we learn, <laughs> the better these technologies will get. And so they're in some ways tied together. Conduct critical scientific reviews of previous animal studies to identify the areas in which the use of animals can be immediately ended. Again, immediately end, immediately end. Uh, make sure there's an ethical analysis and that's another whole story. And then this one's not so bad. Work to harmonize and promote international acceptance of non-animal testing methods for regulatory toxicity testing requirements. And that's already happening, okay? So again, the themes here, right? Eliminate animal use. They're poor models. They impede scientific progress. Decrease the funds for animal studies. Identify areas where the use of animals can be immediately ended. Then they have uh, this, I love this page. So based on their data, this is what they think. And this is what they're telling everybody. And this is what people believe. Based on their data, we can end the use of animals immediately in these areas of study. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, immunology. Infectious disease, nerve regeneration, neurodegenerative diseases like ALS and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease that we're still struggling with, neuropsychiatric disorders, sepsis, stroke, substance abuse, trauma. You don't need to look at animals for this anymore ever again because you can use these new stem cell technologies I'm going to show you. That's what they're telling everybody. And they're, and they're basing it on a little bibliography that they play games with in terms of their messaging. It's a messaging game. What do you think of this? Raise your hand if you would be okay. If we immediately stopped studying animals, despite what you know about how it works and how much longer we're living and how much healthier everybody is, including your pets, would it be all right with you, raise your hand, if we just stop using animals to study cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, nerve regeneration, neurodegenerative diseases, which are common right now, would that be all right? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think it's ridiculous. Keep your hand up if you think it's outright dangerous. That's exactly right. 
But this, this is what they're telling people. And the scary part is they make it look very credible and they're telling our legislators. Now this came out of the mouths and both sides of the aisle, by the way, this is, this is no longer a partisan issue. Um, so this is representatives Lewin Mace and they wrote a bipartisan letter um, opposing animal research. Well, they say testing because they also don't know the difference funded by the NIH and the NIH mainly funds basic research, not testing, but that's another story. But I want to read for you the language and you tell me where you heard it, right? Cease funding of new projects involving animals uh, in disease research where there's ample evidence of poor translation from animal models, right? It's the blue words I want you to focus on, right? Um, conduct thorough systemic scientific reviews, right? So that we can determine um, the areas where the use of animals can be immediately ended. Where'd you hear that? Right. Prioritize funding for research that uses non-animal, human-relevant research methods. Where'd you hear that? It was right out of that PETA report, wasn't it? Right. And that's an interesting thing too, this human relevant. It's humans <laughs> who have had all of these biomedical successes, right? All the medical advances we've been talking about were developed for what? Humans. And so how is any of the work that happened in animals not human relevant? Of course it's human relevant, but they're creating a catchphrase. It's just like the P word that people used to say about dogs, and I won't say it. The PM word. I won't say it. Right. They're creating, they're creating or the adopt don't shop business. They're creating sort of like a, a little gimmick, a slogan. And they're saying human relevant because the point is if these non-animal technologies are human relevant, the assumption is what? That the animal work is what? Not human relevant. See how that goes? So we've got these two legislators writing a letter <laughs> to the NIH, the largest granting agency in the world for biomedical studies telling them they gotta, you know, gotta knock it off because basically PETA said so without them saying PETA said so. They are now parroting what they've heard because they believe it. Now, what are these uh, stem cell technologies real quickly? You've all heard, and of course, the fact that they have fancy names makes them uh, appear to be even more credible, right? Like organs on chips, for example, right? These are very powerful technologies and they have promise and they have a lot of limitation to them. We have to be realistic about them, but they're already being used for a variety of things to help us answer questions that we can answer about some aspect of these things we're looking at, right? And that's not news, that's been happening. And the continued, develop the continued development of them is something almost everybody in research supports um, because we actually can uh, lace these things with human cells. In fact, you could even, in some cases, lace these things, let's say, with uh, the tumors from a particular person and let it run to see like which drug would work best for that person. So they are pretty astounding. And I, I have a very quick video to sort of get you to see that because it's a hard thing to sort of conceptualize. So those are actual human cells. They look a bit. It's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. So that's an example of what we call a microphysiological system, because it's a little tiny replication of some aspect of physiology. Um, and there's organoids that we can do that with, and, and so, and, and organs on chips. And so that's an example of a microphysiological system. Now, here's a reality check for you. I said they are powerful and they're exciting. 
and they're very meaningful and they can be used for very specific purposes, specifically where they'll have the most relevance is in that pre-screening part. Remember the thing with the animals before we put the drugs in the clinical, into clinical trials with people, we just wanna make sure it's safe. We wanna see what the toxicity is. That's where it's going to have its first application. Um, and it's already being used that way. Um, and that data gets collected along with the animal data when drugs go to the FDA, for example. So it's not like it's a new thing, um, but what the, what the activists are saying, especially PETA is, well, we're not talking about using them in conjunction with, we're talking about what? Yeah, using them instead, right? Getting rid of the animals and just using them. Well, here's a reality check. We're not ready, okay? So this, there's a lot of different papers on this, but this one is good because it was a consortium and they went and evaluated a lot of these technologies. And, um, and looked at their promise and their limitations. I mean, these, these technologies are in their infancy. Just using them in a standardized way, we aren't to yet, right? Uh, standardizing the materials that we use when we use them, uh, training people in a standardized fashion to use them, all of these things outside of you know, their own particular level of effectiveness, we're just not there yet. And basically that's what this says. And it summarizes, uh, this is sort of from the abstract, but it just basically says right out loud, it's unlikely that a rodent or human equivalent model is achievable through a finite number of microphysiological systems in the near future. They don't say abandon it. They say what a reasonable person would say. They say, we need to build consensus and promote the gradual incorporation of these models into tiered approaches for safety assessment, right? And decision-making, and that involves animals. And that is how we need to start thinking about this. We need to start thinking, we have to have an integrative mindset about these things. We have to allow, you know, because what's happening is animal research is happening here. The NPS stuff is happening over here, the alternatives. And what we need to do is, is somebody's got to, in a very deliberate way, join them together and say, listen, pull these things together and start learning from one another. So we really can move in the direction of what I like to call stronger science, faster cures and fewer animals, right? But that's not what happened, what's happening because the legislators are getting their cues from, from PETA, right? And this is the promise we have. They're promising them that these things are true and they should go out and put it in, you know, put it into the world and, and create bills, but they're, they're misinforming them. They're lying to them. And they're not giving them accurate information. And these legislators then are making decisions based on completely inaccurate information. Now this one, <laughs> and you've heard of the next bill I'm gonna talk about. Wait, Is before, the I, before I play it, let's go back. You're going to see a gentleman whose name is Justin Goodman being interviewed by somebody on some news, news thing. Um, and Justin Goodman is from PETA originally. And he is now a member of a very rabid animal rights group called the White Coat Waste Project that some of you have heard. And he's going to be asked right now about the FDA and dogs. And you're going to hear some, some very um, misleading for sure. And uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the language meant to create a lot of emotion and anger. And, uh, and he's very, very good at what is sensational. Yeah, so you're going to hear all of that. And this is about the FDA. Now, remember, the FDA is also getting attacked by all of this, right? Because they're the ones that are validating the drugs. And they're being told, you don't need animals anymore. <laughs> Peter said so. So here's the interview. Is the FDA forcing drug companies to do experiments on dogs and puppies, even though these drug companies are against it and can offer alternative testing? Absolutely, and we have the evidence. Uh, we just released a report called Broken Bureaucracy that reviewed 200 drug applications submitted by pharmaceutical companies. And we see time and again that companies are being forced to poison puppies as young as a week old, uh, force them to ingest massive overdoses of experimental drugs. In some cases, these companies are even taping the dog's mouth shut so they can't vomit up these, these drug overdoses. Uh, some of the companies that are doing this don't want to. Some companies have pushed back on the FDA and as a result have been punished. Uh, in the case of COVID, there's been at least one um, very promising COVID treatment that was held up because the FDA was trying to force the company to conduct testing on dogs that the, the company, which is based in D.C., insisted didn't need to be done. Have you been able to determine if the FDA is just behind the times or, or what's the reasoning for this? Uh, the reason is a nearly century old law that states that new drugs have to be tested on animals and then humans. And th because this law was written in the 1930s, it doesn't account for new technologies that exist now that can replace 
uh, animal testing that's outdated and the FDA itself admits fails 90% of the time uh, to predict what happens in people. So we have some outdated laws and then the FDA has a patchwork of regulations that are very unclear. So in some cases, companies are doing animal testing when, when they don't need to. Uh, and the FDA has not revised its regulations to reflect all these new technologies that exist. I wanna ask you, um, were animals used in the recent development of the COVID-19 vaccines? The answer to that is yes and no. Uh, thankfully, the FDA was flexible because of the urgency of COVID-19 and allowed the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines to go right into humans without the usual animal testing, which would have delayed them years uh, and actually might have misled us and said that these vaccines that work in people, uh, it's possible they wouldn't have worked in animals and we, we wouldn't have had them. Uh, there was some animal testing after they went into after the drugs went into humans, but the whole process was expedited because the FDA allowed these companies to uh, overcome some red tape uh, and use high tech technologies that got us vaccines faster than we would have had them, safer than we would have had them had we had the companies been forced to rely on animal testing. You find that kind of odd that a pandemic has to force the FDA to stop using animals for testing? It's unfortunate, but I think what it does is really provide the evidence that the FDA can and should be doing this on a much wider basis for all drugs for any type of disease. There's a lot of patients suffering out there, uh, not only from COVID, but from cancer, uh, from AIDS, from lots of diseases that don't have cures yet. And one of the big roadblocks with all of those is the heavy reliance on animal testing in the past. Uh, so what we're doing is promoting a bill called the Alternatives to Animals for Regulatory Fairness Act, the ARF Act. And this is a bipartisan piece of legislation that simply says, if a drug, it doesn't ban animal testing, but it says if a drug company can get you the data you need to make it, the FDA, the data it needs to make a determination about the safety and effectiveness of a drug with no animal testing and using high throughput technologies like organs on a chip, which are the cutting edge right now, um, if a company can do that, they should be allowed to. They shouldn't be forced to poison puppies just because a law written in 1938 tells them to. Are you seeing any opposition to that new bill? Uh, there is. You know, you'd be surprised to learn that there are pro-animal testing lobby groups that are specifically dedicated to continuing and even expanding animal testing, despite the knowledge we have about how wasteful it is. Um, but luckily, like I said, we do have bipartisan support in Congress. The bill, the RFAC was introduced by Brendan Boyle, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, Madeline Dean, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, and Brian Fitzpatrick, a, a Republican from Pennsylvania. Um, so, and there's been additional Republicans and Democrats who joined on to that bill. So despite the opposition from some uh, entrenched uh, experimenters who want the expansion of animal testing, we're seeing great bipartisan support on Capitol Hill, and also wide bipartisan support among Americans. Polls that we've been conducting show that about two thirds of people want the FDA to get rid of these outdated regulations that are forcing companies against their will to poison puppies when there's a better way to do it. When there's a better way to do it. That we know the data explains to us is not ready for prime time and is not capable. In fact, when you go to conferences, and I've been to several um, where they're talking about these technologies, the researchers who are working on these stem cell-based technologies, and you ask them point blank, can, can these replace intact living systems? You know, Can they replace an animal? They will tell you, no, <laughs> no, we're not there yet, right? But you can hear all of this misinformation that's kind of weaved into some stuff that's kind of true, you know, and, and they create this, this, you know, this very compelling story and they've got, you know, they've got a data, a paper, right? They've got a paper because they're experts, right? And there's the media taking them seriously and all the legislators taking them seriously. And the point of this was to get the FDA to change its law. So how many of you have heard of the FDA Modernization Act? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Okay, and this is a little concerning as well because most people don't, uh, don't hear these things and aren't paying much attention to them, right? So uh, it was touted uh, with all of this messaging as being a bill that was going to uh, force the FDA to basically uh, to tell the FDA that they could start validating drugs without animals. And that's true, but they've sort of been doing that <laughs> for a while already when possible. Their job is to make sure that something really, really risky doesn't get out into the public, right? And kill people by the millions, right? And so um, here is, uh, here are a couple, this is Cory Booker and, and Rand Paul. 
And they're talking about, they were all over this. We're going to sign this thing in a law and I'm going to show you how they were messaging it because they don't understand what they're actually, what the bill actually says, right? So the bill, what the bill does is it includes now, it gives, a, it, it provides language for the FDA to consider all of these things that they sort of already been considering, but it lays them out specifically in addition to whatever is required from animal studies. It's basically, they're basically saying, listen, uh, anything that is scientifically sound enough to validate uh, use and release will accept. And we understand that a good part of the time that's going to be from animals, right? So it doesn't ban animals at all. It just says, hey, consider some of this other information. If it's really strong, we want to look at it, right? So that's what it says. And this is, this is from the bill. Animal tests is actually in the bill as something that should be considered when uh, applying for some kind of FDA approval for the release of a drug. That's not how it's being messaged. And this is the problem, right? So here are some quotes. Here's from Cory Booker. And again, I'll just go into the kind of the blue parts, right? And tell me where you've heard this. Very important, right? The passage of my bill will avoid the needless suffering of countless animals. Now that experimental drug testing can be done with, ready? Modern non-animal alternatives that are more scientifically relevant. Where'd you hear that before? Ada, this legislation brings us one step closer to eliminating the cruel practice of unnecessary animal testing. Raise your hand if based on what I've told you, you think it's unnecessary. Of course not, right? Uh, Tim Kaine, I'm glad the Senate passed this legislation that would prevent the suffering of innocent animals while still ensuring that critical medicines are safe and effective. Data has shown, ready? That animal testing is not always the best indicator of a drug's effects in humans. And we have alternative testing methods that are equally or more effective. Is that what the paper I showed you that was done by actual scientists said? No, it's what PETA said. The FDA Modernization Act 2.0 will accelerate innovation and get safer, more effective drugs to market more quickly by cutting red tape that is not supported by current science. So the value of animals in research, according to this gentleman, is not supported by science, by current science. And then he goes on and on about that needless uh, use of animals in research. This is what our legislators are saying. And people are voting for this because they don't know any better. And so the, the law passed, and honestly, it doesn't change anything. It changed nothing. Functionally, everything is exactly the same. And in some ways, I'm kind of glad it passed because what it does do by listing these things sort of independently is it, it will probably engage uh, more folks who are trying to um, get drugs approved and, uh, and, get, and get drugs validated for approval uh, to have more phone conversations with the folks at the FDA about you know, what science works and you know, what science doesn't with respect to um, validation and release, right? So it's not a bad thing, but they're all acting like it's some new thing that they created to end the use of animals in research. And that is not the case at all, but it's the messaging that is the real problem for us, right? Because they just keep gaslighting. They just keep telling this story the way they're going to tell it. And people are misinformed and they go down this rabbit hole into what's going to be a very, very dark place in human history very soon. Because meanwhile in Maryland, and this is getting toward the end here, because this just happened. <laughs> And Tom Leach and I were talking about it, and he's got several other bills that he will share with you in a little while, right? But when it was going on, even we weren't aware of it. So here's what's happened in Maryland. They just passed a state law. It's been signed into law, signed in on May 8th, right? And it's called the Human Relevant, so here we are again, <laughs> the Human Relevant Research Funding and Animal Testing and Research Contributions, I guess, Act, right? So, um, and basically what it is, is the state saying, we want to, uh, we want anybody who's doing research in the state of Maryland, to uh, focus on alternatives, these non-animal um, uh, technologies, right? And we're gonna provide some funding for that. But guess where they're getting the funding? It also says that anybody who's working with animals in research has to in effect pay a tax to support this fund in Maryland. And the amount of the tax will depend on how many animals you have in your institution for necessary biomedical research. And I can't believe it, but it just got signed into law. And so, 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 what, so what are you saying to our researchers? The public says, we're dying, we're struggling, we're suffering, we need you please to come up with an answer. And then we punish them for that. This just got signed into law. There are 15 federal agencies in Maryland. They don't have to pay the tax, but in the summary, uh, the summary of this bill, you know, this is a sort of commentary. It says in there that, um, there are 35, and that includes uh, 35 institutions, I think it is, and that includes 15 federal agencies who can voluntarily pay the money. 
And you know what's going to happen from that. The name and shame game and more fundraising is going to happen. But this actually passed. Just, uh, just to give you a, sort of an idea, um, it goes into effect January 15th of 2024. The amount that institutions will have to pay ranges between five and $75,000, depending on the number of animals uh, they have that they report to the USDA. If they don't pay as required, they may be subject to a civil penalty of up to $1,000 a day. They're expecting to make close to a million dollars a year from this, but that's only if the 15 federal agencies also volunteer to contribute. And they have a lot of animals, right? Like the NIH would have to pay $75,000 without question, right? This is, I think, the most concerning part. So uh, it looks like Johns Hopkins and, and Neighbor, the National Association of Biomedical Research, were in the know on this, and they were negotiating. This is an HSUS sponsored and pushed bill, by the way. Uh, raise your hand if you're surprised, right, crickets? Nobody's surprised, right? Originally, the penalty, right? This was the penalty originally was going to be a felony charge if you didn't pay the money. Um, and then also some fines, right? Uh, $5,000 fines, but a, f a felony charge. And that's that got negotiated away by Johns Hopkins and neighbor, it looks like, to this civil penalty of $1,000 a day. So we now have in the state of Maryland, anybody doing research in the state of Maryland, has to pay a tax to do the work the American public is begging them to do, right? <laughs> and if they don't, they have to pay a $1,000 a day penalty. And it's actually a law that's passed. It's crazy. So if you thought biomedical research was, was safe, if you thought your future medical health was safe, if you thought the health of your loved ones, including your pets, was safe from this insanity from the animal rights extremists, think again. This will go to state after state after state, I'm sure, unless it turns into some kind of a big you know, poop storm. But most of us, even those, we didn't even know what happened. Tom and I were like, when did this thing get signed? Pretty scary. I've never seen anything like it ever, ever. Have you, Patty? No, insane. It's insane. And at the same time now, the NIH who funds all the basic research. Oh, I should read this to you. I got to read this to you. So this is Kitty Block from the Humane Society. And this is her take on the passage of this law. Because animals and humans are very different, results from animal experiments are often not applicable to people. For example, extensive evidence demonstrates that results from toxicity tests in animals often don't accurately predict toxicity in humans. The animal-based methods used today were developed decades ago. In contrast, Non-animal alternatives are more sophisticated and effective, meaning that they can more accurately and effectively predict how the human body will respond to drugs, chemicals, and treatments. Really, when the science everywhere says, no, that's not true, not yet, or it is true, but only about some really specific aspect of what it is you're looking at. That's the messaging. And they're going to use that, this is HSUS, to carry this bill further. And then things are gonna get interesting. Um, I think that the kinds of animals the institutions will work with will change. The numbers that they work with will change. This will have an impact on how much biomedical research happens for you and your loved ones and your health. This will have an impact. The NIH uh, is also parroting some of this language, but you'll be grateful to know that it's a little bit more reasonable, right? They are talking about, this is the uh, appropriations fund for 2023 for the NIH. Uh, specifically related to research with animals. They're asking um, that uh, the NIH uh, start replacing the use of animals in biomedical research with these alternatives. But they say we're available and appropriate, and that's reasonable language, right? They want to focus on that if they want their money. Um, they want to ensure that appropriate animal models are only used in research when necessary and continue identifying areas of promise for non-animal models. They want to increase funding for research using human relevance. So there's that word again, even the NIH got it non-animal models. So some of that language, again, is parroted by, uh, from where? From PETA, exactly right. So I'm about to end and then I'll take questions. Um, if you haven't listened to my podcast yet, my podcast yet, <laughs> and it's hosted by our friends at the National Animal Interest Alliance, I talk about many of these things, I interview folks, um, and you can go listen to the episodes at getrealpodcast.info. Uh, at the end of the day, and I want to reemphasize this, right? These technologies are not the enemy. Let's not make this an us and them issue and continue to impede progress. It's not an us and them issue, right? That's the problem. We need to establish an integrative mindset about these things. We need to have accurate facts and we need to be realistic about 
where these things are effective and how we can work with uh, the, the techniques we use currently in animal studies to get better information faster. And we do want to reduce the number of animals needed in research whenever we can. And that is the way forward. And that is why um, in, in Get Real, we use this, this phrase all the time, right? We want to come together, have conversations about actual facts, and then use that information you know, based on compassion and collaboration to move in the direction of stronger science, faster cures, and fewer animals. That is the road to progress. That is, the, that is also the road to reducing or hopefully one day eliminating animals in research. Not this argument that is just gonna keep everything in a stalemate. And that's all I have for you today. Sorry to depress you, but I appreciate your time so very much. <laughs> I always love talking to you guys. And I know I'm out of time, but Patty sat down, which means I'm allowed to take some questions.